I'm really, really pleased to be able to introduce our first session of the day. Um, we're going to be hearing a keynote address from Sophie Strand. Sophie Strand is a writer and poet who's based in the Hudson Valley. Her work focuses on the intersection of spirituality, storytelling and ecology. She's the author of A Flowering Wand and will talk about the ecological imagination and her belief that all thinking and imagining happens interstitially between beings, ideas, differences and mythical gradients. The session is pre-recorded um, and Sophie's going to start by reading out a short excerpt. Um, so I invite you to sit back, relax and let her words wash over you and move you to places of new imagination. Um, that's enough for me and um, we'll play the recording now. Thank you. The animate everything. The crow beats its wings with such rapidity that they ripple into liquid. Sunlight streaks across the dawn sky, warped through the wind's weft, weaving a tapestry of breath, pollen, smoke from forest fires a whole country away, carbon excreted as saccharine heat from a hummingbird dull threads of exhaust braided into a heron's exhalations. Smoke has turned the sun flat and red as the sun drawn by a child with a crayon. The sky is the blue of accumulation, layer after layer of pollution, smog, pollen, refracted light, and reproductive matter, spores, pheromones, funk. And sitting on the hill overlooking where the Rondout Creek pours itself into the Hudson River, I think of, wor of the words of Chilean poet Raul Zarita, writing after his torture at the hands of Pinochet's military dictatorship. Life is very beautiful, even now. Life is soup, life is compost, life is contaminated, and life is very alive. I glance from the sky down to my toes, tucked into the fine ashy dirt, and spot a spider, a tumbleweed of silver wire glittering against my foot. And below that are the mycorrhizal threads weaving together the locust trees, the rustla mushrooms, the ghost pipe, the grass with the trees, and fleshing the soil itself so that it can hold steady when the rain slide out of the smog swollen sky. Deeper still is the underworld biosphere of carbon constituted by archaea and bacteria and fungi. Woven into soil's microbiome are the blood of the Muncie Lenapi, the, their stories all but erased, who lived here next to the river continuously for thousands of years before the genocidal Dutch and French arrived. I reach down and pinch the dirt, inhale its waxy, mildewed perfume. No, Divine feminine or divine masculine won't do. God won't do. Neither will a homogenized universalism. This dawn is unruly and textured. There are yellow jackets already looping through the clover, gorgeous from a distance and deadly to my immune system close up. Even the bacteria carefully cushioned in my gut are precarious. One internal shift and it could poison my blood. Everything is connected to something, but not everything is connected to everything. The differences are vital. The smoke that coats my tongue does not belong to me. It is a communication from somewhere else, a molecular signaling interrogation. The miracle isn't that everything is the same, infused with a pearly universal source, but that everything is being, being differently, being chaotically, Panpsychism is the Eurocentric academic idea of what indigenous cultures have long believed. Consciousness is inherent in all matter. There are various ideas of what consciousness is. Thinking and experiencing are differentiated. Does proto-consciousness exist in elementary particles, slowly accumulating into emergent minds like human brains? As Alfred North Whitehead proposed, is mentality inherent in the elements, coalescing as an animate event that can then similarly slump back into thwarted energy of inanimate beings? A squirrel drops a hickory nut on my head. Somewhere a dog is barking, 
An ambulance is drawing its long nervous song through the empty morning streets. Someone is dying. Someone is melting out of being a someone into a patchy heterogeneous everything. Is that death? Is that inanimate? It seems to me that when someone dies, their body becomes even more alive, an aliveness that is plural, polyphonous, suddenly an ecosystem of bacteria and fungi and beetles and beings eating, decaying, breaking down, making soil, making connections. Today, it doesn't matter whether or not I can prove how alive the world is. It doesn't matter if I can prove an electron is having an experience. What matters is that I can feel stories everywhere. Stories that don't depend on language. Stories that don't depend on singularity. Stories that only occur interstitially between beings in the fertile friction prickled boundaries between differences. It is the differences that seem crucial. Without differences, there is no conversation. There is no need for the tender questions that catalyze storytelling and generate landscapes. The gradient of the mountain allows the snow melt and rain to braid into a stream that interrogatively carves and curves down through stone into the valley. The difference between the summit and the valley creates this nourishing thread of water that will irrigate the fields, fill the rock pools, wake up leathery lichen on the side of a stone thrown awkwardly in a field millions of years before by a glacier. The curiosity of a hyphae probing into unfamiliar soil and dead wood is what will make the soil that supports a forest. Audre Lorde writes in her essay, The Master's Tools, within the interdependence of mutual non-dominant differences lies the security which enables us to descend into the chaos of knowledge and return with true visions of our future, along with the concomitant power to affect those changes which can bring that future into being. Difference is that raw and powerful connection from which our personal power is forged. When I think of what I believe in, it is closest to a form of animism, but it is an animism of chaotic difference, of woven contamination. It is an understanding that just because I am alive does not mean I should assume that the aliveness of the hill or the river or the wild roses is the same flavor as my aliveness. Knowing that a stone is alive keeps me alive. And knowing that a stone is alive differently than me keeps me asking questions, keeps me humble and curious and available to surprise. I believe in the animate everything, the differences that sting and prick and destroy and generate and sometimes weave together to create a dense, polluted, gorgeous periwinkle sky. Very welcome in this conversation. Um, so it's amazing to have you um, sort of kick off our um, imagination infrastructuring um, one day event. Um, and I was so glad that you said yes. And the beauty of your words and the, the just the tone and the way, um, yeah, the, the way you use language immediately um, creates a sense of possibility it feels unfamiliar yet deeply familiar it it for me anyway it, it brings my imagination alive and i'm hoping for many people that will be watching this um it does too so i wanted to ask first just how you know it, it seems even odd to talk to you about something like the ecological imagination because I suspect you haven't necessarily consciously separated that out as a thing. It feels so inherent in everything you're doing. And I, I just, but I wondered, yeah, when we talk about the ecological imagination, what does that bring forth for you? Well, first off, thank you so much for including me um, and for asking such an important question. I mean, I always want to problematize the false cut between humans and nature, humans and ecology, that everything we do, be it pollution, be it microplastics, is nature, and that human behavior is natural, even when it feels hideous and far exceeds our simplistic value dualisms. So I think nature is a much bigger, pricklier, stranger thing than humans can possibly conceptualize. You know, we're on the inside, we're not on the outside by virtue of a god trick looking in. 
So I always want to embed us in that interiority. We are inside nature of it being born from its body <laughs> continually. So for me, ecological imagination is all imagination. Even the bad types, even the bad magic is a kind of ecological imagination. <laughs> um, and if we really want to complexify ecology, we can root it back to its original Greek word, which is oikos for household. On the one hand, that's a beautiful conception, which is that we live inside households that are multi-species where beings are generating life, antagonistic, um, helping each other, and that we are never alone. We are always thinking and living and breathing in relationship. On the flip side, the household in question, that Greek household was patriarchal and it was based on a hierarchy of use and utility. A man owned slaves, women, cattle, beings in his household and could decide how they were useful. So ecology is unfortunately conflated with a kind of patriarchal idea of utility, <laughs> that things are useful. And so I always want to interrupt the kind of teleological argument that is Trojan horse inside of conversations of ecology, <laughs> that, um, that ecology imagines an almost theological Eden, whereby every animal has its purpose, every being is intimately, meaningfully cooperating with another. It's much messier than that. <laughs> um, for me, ecological imagination today is best exemplified by one of my favorite metaphors, which is the spider, that research into extended cognition um, I think in particular, some researchers at MIT recently have been showing that spiders don't just think with their brains or even their bodies. They stink, they stink, they think, <laughs> they stink and think, same thing, same thing, but different um, with their whole webs. And if you damage part of their webs, they behave as if they've had a stroke or a brain injury. So they're tugging, they're receiving vibrations, they are feeling. And there's been this very simplistic idea that minds and brains are the same thing and that minds are something that is inside of a single body for me brains are something that happens at the ecotone the interface between beings mind is always a process and interaction and impact <laughs> of friction between beings and i think that's best exemplified by the web and the metaphor of the web which is for me ecological imagination is recognizing that our best thinking never happens inside of a single atomized self or even inside of a human paradigm. It happens in our web of relationality. The microbes, the fungi, the viruses, the soil, the mountains, the deep time sediments be below our feet that then are unlocked and unlocked and churned into exhaust. That for me, ecological imagination melts the idea of the individual as having any kind of ownership over thinking and cognition. I love that. And every time you speak, it's so visual. You you just conjure up so, so many um, images. I love it. Um, and I guess some of the focus of the work that's been happening um, in the UK around imagination has been this focus on the collective. Mm -hmm. um, and again, and I think we, we, we tend to, myself included, have thought of that about um, how do we bring together groups of people and, and create practices that really experiment with what can the collective imagine that an individual never can, but in a way with your, how you you experience the world and, and believe the world is, which I, I, I do, but I probably haven't felt it in the same way you have, you're sort of inviting us to, yeah, the, the collective isn't just is is obviously not just humans it's the more than human and i wondered if you had any like practices that you um could share or that you know of that really congregate that sense of the collective into like imagination practice yeah i do it's very simple um, you know, instead of beginning my morning with any kind of religious practice or meditation or mantra, what I do is I summon by name and not taxonomical Linnaean correct name, whatever intimate nickname, you know, longful cry <laughs> denotes intimacy by name, every being, be it viral, fungal, geological, folkloric, indigenous population, moss, algae, fish in a 20 mile radius of where I live. 
and I summon each being by name, opening up a kind of reciprocal vein of blessing, whereby I send them blessings and they send me one. Um, and sometimes, you know, for me, it takes about an hour, sometimes longer to do that. So I do it, I take my run, I make my coffee, begin my day. When I gift this exercise, which I call weaving the web, which is weaving that whole web or gathering counsel, um, when I get it to people, I say, start small, start, start with one mile. Just think about, are there invasive species? Are there dandelions? What kind of rocks make the buildings that you're living in? Who lived where you are? What ancient beings and megafauna lived where you are? You know, go deep into one spot, put your taproot down into the place where you are. And for me, when I finish that exercise, I realize that every decision I make will capillary out into a vasculature of many beings that when I turn on my car, that exhaust is going out into my extended body and my extended mind, and that I am deeply culpable. And that doesn't change what I do necessarily, but it makes me aware of it in a much more complicated way. Um, I'm suddenly much more able to respond and be responsible to all of these different beings that literally with every breath metabolically, materially rebuilt, rebuild my body, that in many ways, I am the soil, the protozoa, the fungi, the pollen of my area reincarnated. <laughs> I am a holograph of that place in my very body. And so I try and honor that in the mornings by going through this mantra of beings. Um, and of course, there's no correct way to do it. Some days there are less beings, some days there's, there are more but it's just a way of reminding myself that my brain, myself, my aliveness is not just in here, it's in my extended network. Um, and so I think that's a really simple thing to do, especially for people, you know, I deal with disability of, you know, sometimes I'm more able-bodied, sometimes I'm less. And I think it's hard sometimes to, a lot of ecological exercises presume an able body, someone who can go out into nature, who can access it. But the truth is that even our, glitchy bodies are nature and that sometimes if you can't leave your hospital bed or your house your body can be your feral sit spot the fungi in your back in your belly button you know the weather systems of dysbiosis playing your body like an instrument um and so sometimes i say like let your body be your own sit spot and what about dreams do you dream a lot are you a vivid dreamer mm. That's a wonderful question. Um, I think a lot about one of my favorite thinkers, Gaston Bachelard, who distinguishes between reverie and dreams. That reverie is like this open air atlas that happens in a kind of semi-conscious way. And then dreaming is almost completely without your consent, it just takes over your body. So I do both. I spend a lot of time trying to experience soft focus, going on walks without an expectation not trying to actually focus my vision, looking at giant landscapes from a distance, looking outwards and trying to just let the whole of the world into me and to permeate me and to kind of percolate through my, my substances. So I do a lot of reverie. And I think that's how sometimes more interesting ideas come to me as they come externally and they move through my filtration device and change me. But I also dream pretty vividly. I found, I used to keep a dream journal religiously and when I kept it more religiously, every morning I would write it down first thing, the dreams would come more consistently and more vividly. So when I keep up that practice, the dreams come to meet it. You know, they, if, if I put my attention on the dream, the dreams put their attention on me. But I do dream every night. And I oftentimes dream of animals and beings and plants. And in fact, sometimes I'll ask for a being to come to me. I'll say, just give me something in a dream. About three nights ago, I had a dream of a water snake biting me. And I told it to someone who had a very classical kind of Freudian response, which is that was that person who betrayed you recently. And I said, no, I think it was a blessing. <laughs> and I think that one time, the one thing I always want to open up with dreams is that we have a very narrow patriarchal interpretation via Jung and Freud of what archetypes and what dreams are and what they mean. But we have to we have to reroute them into a much more complex history. But, you know, the snakes are always a symbol of the goddess with their whole shivering kinetic force attached to the ground. That snakes for me are a blessing, even though in many modern interpretations they would be considered to be a malevolent force. And so I think letting you know who is it? James Hillman says, "Don't interpret the dream. 
having the dream is the dream doing the work. Let the dream work through you. And so I think that's something that I really like to, to say. It's like, let the dream work you from behind, um, like an author. Let it author you rather than trying to pin it like a butterfly and figure it out. Do you have dream practices? I have tried them with, um, there's a, 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 a friend of mine called Kate Genevieve who does, um, she does dream practice and I've joined some of her sessions where I remember doing one, I was in Chile um, a couple of years ago and, and not having, I was having quite a difficult time and I really appreciated um, the ritual she created where there was a group of us that met um, the night before she created a, you know, a sort of circle and a ritual. I mean, it was over Zoom. Um, and during that time, we had to have found, um, we had to have brought to that something to plant in the ground the next morning. Um, and we had it under our pillow. We spent the night with that, with, with the seed to plant, um, which I guess was carried through our dreams. And then the next morning we we met and shared stories of our dreams and went out and planted the seed. Um, and that I was really- that. That's so powerful. And I think about, you know, for much of human history across geographies and different populations, dreaming has been seen as a powerful healing modality, a technology. We have the Aslepion, Aslepion places that you would go to receive a healing dream. And that the dream was always localized. It came from the land, used your body, and gave you information, but that it had a root system in a specific place. So sometimes I think I'm receiving dreams from where I live, that you know, our bodies, when they make contact with the earth, receive the earth's dreams. Yeah, and Vanessa, um, who's doing the second keynote, who I, I think you know, um, she's talked before about dreaming through the land. Um, and I love in your book, The Flowering Wand, which everyone should read um in your acknowledgements um you acknowledge the land around you and i don't know if you just want to say a bit i, I just love that that was a really key acknowledgement in your book i don't think it's what i said before which is there is no singular sophie mind inside of me that authors my projects that any work i ever do is an interface so as you know the horizon isn't doesn't exist. It's the interaction between the ocean <laughs> and the sky, the, you know, the distant land and the sky. And for me, all of my projects are that interface um, and between me and a place. And it was really the deep life, the deep thinking I did walking the same paths again and again, like song lines where I lived on the Mohican Tuck, the river that flows both ways. Um, that inspired the book I wrote. And I think that all of my thinking that goes into my books happens on walks in a place. And so I'm like a spider web getting pollen and dew in it. Like, you know, most of the ideas get stuck in my web, but they're not from me. They're not generated by me. And I always want to acknowledge that, that, you know, I am a, a faulty instrument for a holobiont assemblage of beings. You know, of course, I'm going to change and mistranslate certain things. I'm not perfect. I'm not a perfect radio transmitter, but you know, I am trying my best. Um, I know we probably have to wrap up in a minute. So, was, I I remember actually when I I first came across your work through an Advaya course, um, and I I can't remember the name of the course. What's the, the you you've run it several times now with Advaya. I've done two courses with them. One was on rewilding the Gospels, Myth and Mycelium, and that was very specifically on rerouting um, the Christian tradition and its original ecological and social context. And then I did one on rewilding mythology, which was much more generalized with many teachers. I think it was that one. That I should know that. <laughs> I think it's because I've read quite a few of your texts as well. Um, but I remember at the end of that course, um, at the end of that session, I, I asked you a question, this was, maybe it was a, a, over a year ago, but I guess, um, so I'm gonna ask you a similar question now. Um, I, I know you've just sort of talked about being, um, you know, like a, an imperfect vessel, but I feel like, like everything you do feels so alive and like it's flowing through you, it's very generative. 
and I I feel like you're yeah it's very generous how you are like passing these things out into the world and you've written a book I think you've got another book coming out um two more coming out um which we'll definitely share links to um in in the chat um but I wonder what we can all do because I, I'm just interested in how you imagine your work being carried through us and by us as well, who are in this wider web of of life with you. Um, when you're very generative, how we carry that? Well, I like to say, you know, the idea of an individual author is a very modern conception created by alphabetic literacy. But for most of human history, knowledge has been oral and relational and it has belonged to a community who keeps it alive by resurrecting it in breath, in relationship, to keep, to keep it moving, in boats of breath. So, you know, I, I, I think right now we need to relax our ideas of ownership of ideas because the times are urgent. And I oftentimes say good ideas like a game of hot potato. If you're still holding it when the tidal waves come, when the forest fires come, you've lost the game. Give away everything. Don't try and perfect it. Give your best ideas away and trust that someone else may think them better. And I'm a person who has a genetic condition that's incurable that will probably kill me sooner than most people. So I do have a sense of great urgency that I don't have time to waste. And so I don't think I would be as generative and, and write as much if I didn't have that feeling of urgency. And I oftentimes share the story of Scheherazade, who it's the frame narrative for the 1001 Nights of the Arabian Tales. And she's the vizier's daughter married to the king who marries a woman every night and then kills her um, and then marries a new woman the next day. And she stays alive by telling this adrenaline fueled story that never ends and compels the king to keep her alive. And so I oftentimes invite people into storytelling as emergency. Storytelling is an adrenaline fueled way of keeping yourself alive, trusting that if the story keeps you alive, it may keep someone else alive. And so I want to invite people to ask do an inventory of what story is most urgent to you. What if you acknowledge that you have limited time on earth? What would be the story you would most want to tell? The art you would most want to make? Um, and, and devote yourself to that. It doesn't have to be cool. It doesn't have to seem to be the most important thing. But if, if it's urgent to you, it will save someone else. And so I will probably not be able to complete the projects I want to complete in my life. But I'm trying to create good soil. So a good ecosystem of ideas that are unfinished with open enough space that someone else can come in and plant seeds in it and grow something else. And so I'm very interested in the idea of incompletion, leaving space for other people to come in and take over my work. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. And that, yeah, I guess the event is called Imagination Infrastructures. And in some ways, I feel that that's all. So the mycelium of yeah. like, it, it it's carrying things over time and deeply um yeah and that i i think i can see how you're creating really rich soil um thank you so much for you. joining us um and yeah we'll definitely share more about all the things that people can do to read your work and um experience it um thank you thank you cassie and thank you to everyone Um, wow, I feel both in soft focus and feel a sense of urgency. Um, I wasn't expecting that session to be so resourcing and practical, and I feel like I walked away with lots of ideas of practical things that I can do to embody the work that Sophie was talking about. Um, and I hope you do. I also just want to say a huge thank you to this amazing community that we have with here with us who are sharing so many amazing resources and reflections and even just a sentence about how things that are landing that are helping kind of connect up between what we're hearing on the screen but also this community that we have here and as Sophie said so much of this work is about connection and relationships and being together with each other and so I really appreciate all everyone every single person that is um, sharing in the chat but also sharing in their hearts um, so please do uh, keep that going. Um, we are coming up to a bit of a break. Um, so we have until 
10 10 uh, before the next session, which is going to be on the unimaginable. Um, but I think we'll also have um, lots of practical fitting um, within that. Um, so uh, please do look after your bodies, maybe go and have some fresh air and connect with the ecology that is around you or the plants that are within your home. Um, and um, we'll pause there and we'll be back together at 10.10.